I think that one of the key, I mean, this is, this is a key move that I made, but the key, you know, the key move in general needs to be, you know, we, we cannot hack ourselves secure. Um, you know, there's been lots of sort of thought pieces about this. Um, but the, you know, the idea being, we, you know, we, we can't just keep breaking things and expect things to get better. We have to find ways of, okay, how are we going to bring this into, into normal development processes? And certainly, you know, OWASP is a, is a big part of that. Welcome to the DevSec for Scale podcast, the show that makes security a first-class citizen for growing companies. My name is Jeremy Hest, Head of Developer Relations at Aquilus, the secrets management SaaS platform. This interview podcast brings security experts and practitioners together to offer practical and actionable ways for small and growing companies to implement security best practices using shift left principles without interrupting developer life cycles. Welcome back, everybody, to the DevSec for Scale podcast. I'm Jeremy Hess from Keyless.io, and with me today, a fantastic guest and a friend of mine, Josh Grossman. He's the CTO at Balance Security, and he is an OWASP Israel board member. Now, Josh, before we talk a little bit more about you and your background, can you give us a brief introduction to OWASP in case people are unaware, which I'm sure they're not, uh, and we'll get into a little bit more about your involvement as well. Yeah, no problem at all. Really great uh, to be on with you today. Uh, great to speak to you. Um, yeah, so OWASP. So I don't know how many people have heard of OWASP already. I hope lots, but uh, I guess there's no guarantees, right? So um, OWASP is the Open Web Application Security Project. Um, it was started in the early 2000s. And really the idea is to provide sort of free and open resources for software security. The idea is to have all sorts of different sort of knowledge bases and projects and tools that people can use to build more secure software that for the most part is you know, something that's freely available and freely usable without sort of licensing concerns or um, you know, big, big costs. So practically speaking, OWASP has sort of two key main items aspect it has uh, chapters all around the world we've got one here in uh, israel we've got uh, m- many other cities around the world so hundreds and hundreds of cities have OWASP chapters that meet up a few times a year and have talks on various different topics um, and there are also the OWASP projects they're also about probably more than 200 projects now um, that uh, OWASP sort of oversees and these can be tools to assess security or help build security in these can be documentation to how to build secure software but you know the everything is sort of built around this idea of we want to build more secure applications perfect so now that we have that out of the way tell us a little bit about yourself your background and uh you know how you're involved in OWASP today sure so yeah um like you said my name is Josh Grossman um and I don't know I guess I've always sort of been excited about security, you know, doing things on the school network back in uh, secondary school days. But uh, I sort of started off as a more general IT consultant and I've sort of gradually specialized slowly, slowly more firstly in security and then in application security. And I spent many years doing application penetration testing, going in, breaking applications, you know, feeling happy. Yeah, I've made, done it again. Um, but I guess gradually, I sort of spent more time and more thought about, okay, well, it's all very well coming in and breaking stuff and, you know, putting out reports saying here are all your problems, but I spent more time on projects with actually helping organizations beforehand saying, okay, well, how can we build security into applications? How can we put this into the process that when we get to the breaking stage, there are a lot less findings and a lot less uh, hassle. So that's sort of a gradual process and it's culminated in my, my current position that I started a few months ago working as a CTO for Bounce Security, where we specialize in providing sort of value-driven application security guidance and uh, support. The idea being Perfect. that we want to work with development teams to actually say, well, let's, you know, let's build, build this in as part of your day-to-day, but in a way that you're going to sort of feel value from and um, feel that works for you. Awesome. So actually, I yeah. Going back to mentioning about breaking applications, it was really interesting. Mm-hmm. I've listened to some podcasts, uh, Darknet Diaries is one of, the, <laughs> one of the ones that I listened to. Really interesting. And it was always amazing to me how the same hack could work on so many programs and applications that like you just do the same thing over and over. And it just seems that most developers seem to miss pretty much the same thing. So I wonder why that is. I don't know if there's an answer for that. It's just something that you know, in my mind comes up and I'm like, well, why is it that everybody 
seems to miss these same issues. So maybe OWASP actually has ways of, of dealing with <laughs> those specific uh, risks, but it was just a, a point that I had to mention because, yeah, yeah, really, yeah, really I mean, interesting to me. I mean, yeah, Darknet Diaries is, is, a, is a great podcast and so many great, <clears throat> great stories on there um, and really interesting stories. He's, uh, I think he's, he's uh, Jack Reisider, I think. He's a really great storyteller and sort of brings it out really nicely. But uh, yeah, I mean, you know, this is, this is not a new, a new industry. And I think that, you know, I, I certainly like in my own, <laughs> my own uh, bio that I'd sent to conferences and stuff for a long time, I uh, included uh, and uh, dreams of not finding uh, cross-site scripting in every application because uh, it, you know, it's, it's pretty much the reality. Like you say, you go to a, pretty much every single application and, and then, you know, that's one particular finding you find in, so many different applications and I was like you know why can't we fix this why can't we fix this and you know on, on, the, on the one hand fixing things is, you know, is difficult it's a difficult problem there's lots of different ways in which it can come about every sort of framework works like differently everyone sort of exposes a different way in which it can a similar thing can manifest um, but I think there's also there's also I think a historical problem that it's always sort of the hacks and the hacking and the breaking that sort of gets um, the attention and gets revered and sort of that's considered exciting. You, know, you ask someone about getting into security, oh yeah, I want to be a penetration tester because that's what sounds cool and that's what sounds fun. Um, and sort of people gradually realize that actually, for the most part, you're writing long reports and you know, the reports are the important part because the reports are actually the deliverable. The breaking is sort of, okay, it's fun, but it's the report is a valuable part. And I think that, one of the key, I mean, this is, this is a key move that I made, but the key, you know, the key move in general needs to be, you know, we, we cannot hack ourselves secure. Um, and, you know, there's been lots of sort of thought pieces about this, um, but the, you know, the idea being, we, you know, we, we can't just keep breaking things and expect things to get better. We have to find ways of, okay, how are we going to bring this into, into normal development processes? And certainly, you know, OWASP is a, is a big part of that. It's about saying, well, you know, here are the resources that we need to do that. Um, so I personally am involved in a, in a couple of projects related to OWASP. Um, most most of my primary involvement is as a project leader on the application security verification standard. And this is quite sort of a, a, a big document that aims to hit be a list of requirements for a secure application. These are the requirements you need to take into account when you want to build a secure application. And there's quite a lot there because application security is a, you know, there's a lot going on. It's a, it's a big area, but it's very much about you know, build, building things in and you know, thinking about it. Uh, you know, we talk about shift left, but it should really be sort of spread left because we we can't just move all the screws to the left and not leave any on the right. We need to have it spread across the whole process. And you know, ASVS, uh, that project is very much part of that, having those ideas up front and new requirements up front. Oh, that's great. Um, so talking more about some of the other projects of OWASP, because of course that's sort of the main uh, overarching theme here. Um, so. Talking about risks, there's a uh, project called OWASP Top 10 Risks, probably something more people have heard of. I mean, we, the truth is those risks are probably things that are just noted by many researchers and writers and, and hackers as well anyway. But one of the interesting projects that, that you know, I saw and that, that was interesting to me was the Top 10 Proactive Controls Project. And I think this is very relevant, especially uh, you know, for application security specifically. Uh, and so what could you tell us, you know, what, what's that project generally about and how can developers, uh, younger companies, uh, you know, learn to already bake in those types of controls? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I mentioned ASVS and ASVS is sort of designed to be sort of the, the standard, the comprehensive, um, way of building a secure application. But there's a lot going on there. You know, ASVS has currently somewhere between 200 and 300 requirements. Okay, that's a, that's a lot to think about. That's a lot to do. And we don't necessarily expect that that's going to be the first thing you do because that's not practical. You know, you know we're here today primarily to talk about, you know, software security for startups and DevSec for startups. And 200, 300 controls for a startup isn't practical. And we, I think that, that's well understood. Now, you know, if someone's heard of OWASP, a lot of the times what they've heard of is the OWASP top 10 risks. That's sort of the most famous project. That's the one that gets the most attention. Um, and it's a really, you know, it's a really great project, a really important project. Um, but its primary goal is awareness. It's more about saying application security is a problem. Okay, this is a problem we need to think about. Here are various, you know, a list of the top 10 aspects of that problem that maybe you need to think about. 
but it's it's very much designed as sort of an awareness as a, a marketing document you know it's not a that's not a controversial thing to say that's sort of well well understood by by everyone including the project leaders and, you know, that's the purpose the purpose is to push application security because you know we do need to you know it does need sort of awareness at the highest levels um but once you dig into the top 10 risks everyone's like oh you need, you need to know the OS top 10 well, you know what are the OS top 10 I mean, i'm not going to go through every single one but you know, just for example you know number three on the most recent OS top 10 is injection okay injection oh we have to think about injection what does that mean well uh, injection actually means sql injection no sql injection hql injection code injection xpath injection ldap and you know this is a you know a bottomless pit of how we you know different issues that we need to think about here um and certainly if i'm working with developers i don't want to sort of bring this straight in and say you hear a bunch of problems you know go and have fun like what, what are they gonna do developers want requirements they want okay we need to build something what do we need to build and to look from that perspective they don't just want to receive a bunch of problems in a area that they're less familiar with they probably want as few requirements as possible <laughs> exactly you know startups want to build the minimum viable product right they want to build what they need to build and not spend extraneous time because they do not have extraneous time um and trying to just digest the top 10 and say well what does that actually mean the top 10 risks it's, it's not practical so that brings us to the proactive controls. It's also a, a, an OS top 10, 10 project, but it's sort of the OS top 10 proactive controls. And this is already a little bit more practical. This is a little bit more sort of developer focused because it's saying, look, here are, here are things you need to take into account when you're building an application. Here are sort of design considerations. Here are sort of security, almost you know, security philosophies or security ideas that you need to have in, um, have in place. So, you know, it, it defines 10 items. It's obviously not everything. If you want everything, you have to go to ASVS, but we don't want everything we want. Okay, let's focus on the, the key aspects. Let's focus on the key areas. Um, and it basically says, you know, here, here are things that you can take into account when you're building. Um, think about security already at the requirement stage. Um, think about the security frameworks or libraries that are relevant for your particular development language. Think about how you're going to access the database that you're using securely. Um, Think about how you're going to handle data, whether that's uh, encoding it or escaping it before it goes into some sort of sensitive context, maybe whether that's validating it as you receive it. But, you know, these are already more, much more sort of practical aspects that we want developers to think about. Um, ultimately, you know, we want security to be another aspect of software. We don't want it to be some sort of, sort of magical extra function that sits on the side and, I don't know, runs tools and spits out results. You know, security is part of the application development process. And you wouldn't say, okay, we've built the application, but it's completely unusable. We, don't, we hadn't thought about usability. We, you know, we've built the application, but it's slow as a dog. You know, it's, um, we didn't think about performance. In the same way, we wouldn't want to build an application and say, we didn't think about security. So there's no, there's no security considerations. You, know, it's just, you just need, need to be another consideration when a developer is building an application. And you know, the top 10 proactive controls is, is designed to provide that initial sort of gateway into security. Um, it's written as a document. It's not just a list of controls. It's sort of written as a narrative document. It's written in a way that's a little bit easier to consume um, and easier to work through. And it's, you know, it's designed to be understandable. It's designed to be an initial overview of, okay, here's how you build secure software. Great. Now, I have an interesting one um, for you. Is there anything, can you give us a, an interesting story, probably potentially, about something that you maybe found when you were, you know, doing a bit of the hacking back in the day and how you turn that into something that today you're actually more proactive in, in working on helping developers and companies to change, to fix on their side. Um, I think one of the big, one of the big things that I, um, and then one of the, one of the sort of big moments for me was really, when I was working as a breaker and working as a hacker, and I suddenly realized, why, you know, why am I spending all this time on the outside, just like throwing attacks at an application um, and seeing what sticks, you know, not knowing really know what's going on behind the scenes. And there was one project I worked on as a, you know, as a penetration tester where um, we actually asked them for the code. Like they said, oh, do you want the code? I was like, oh, okay. You know, they added this as read-only to so they get have a repository and we had access to their code. So, you know, we were attacking the application, but we can also see what's going on behind the scenes. And that made me immediately knew that, you know, I knew what database they were using. I knew not how their, how their application flowed. And I could see that I was trying, you know, SQL injection payloads to try and get a valid SQL injection. It wasn't working. I looked in the code. I could see that for the most part, they were doing some sort of 
validation. It wasn't great a great version of validation. It was sort of checking that they didn't have any dodgy characters in the input, which isn't a great fix for SQL injection. Uh, for SQL injection, you want to parameterize all your queries. You want to make sure that uh, you are you know, using parameters and you're building the query in, that, in, a, in a specific way where the data that's being input gets put into the query in, in, a, in a secure way and not just sort of string concatenated on one thing after the other, which is a uh, not secure way of doing it. But they were saying, okay, we're, we're going to do the string concatenation, but we'll block certain characters that we think are dangerous, which as we'll see, isn't ideal because I went through the code, I did some searching and sure enough, I found the place they'd forgotten to do that. Um, I found the place they forgot to do that. I could see the code. So I knew exactly what SQL injection payload was going to work there. And I used that payload and yeah, sure enough, I had their database sat on my desk in a short amount of time. Um, you know, better me than you know, a real uh, uh, you know, malicious actor, let's say. But um, you know, I think that was a big moment to me where it said, well, you know, penetration testing traditionally has been a very sort of outside activity. It's been very much about you know, if someone comes in from outside, doesn't really know what's going on, just throws a load of attacks at an application and sees what happens. And a much more sort of collaborative and sort of open box approach gives you far more value because the tester knows exactly what their target is. They know exactly what technologies they're targeting. They know exactly how they need to tailor attacks to, to work. If the, you know, the less time they spend having to tailor an attack, the more time they've got to test other things. And you know, it's about that sort of collaboration between, you know, say, penetration testing as an example and, and development. But you know, it's sort of brought home that, again, security doesn't come from outside. It's not something that's just an outside consideration that bothers us once a year. It needs to be something that's sort of day in, day out, that developers are thinking about, that you know, when security comes in, developers are like, oh yeah, we'll come have a look at this. Or you know, we think this might be a bit uh, concerning, focus your attention here. About having a much more sort of collaborative approach. And again, developers are still thinking about that as part of their day-to-day. -day. That's one of the things they think about when they're, when they're building a feature or they're designing a new uh, area of the application. Got it. So a uh, question that I like to ask all my guests, um, can you give us, you know, from your experience, um, doesn't have to be the, the basic answers that everyone gives it can be your, you know, your take, but what are one or two, uh, ideas, one or two things that developers at younger companies, uh, scaling, growing companies can already put into practice today from a security standpoint that won't really, uh, put too much burden on you know, their cycles, um, because obviously, like we talked about, they're trying to get their minimum viable product out and they don't necessarily have as much time for security, but what are one or two things that you think they could put controls, they could put in place already at the beginning that, you know, would help make sure their applications are secure, but at the same time, won't take too much of their time. So I have maybe what's like a slightly controversial answer on this. Um, you know, I think many years ago when people thought about, oh, do you do you know, application security? If you've got an application security program, people are like, yeah, we do penetration testing once a year. That's our application security program. Um, I think nowadays when people say, oh, you do have an application security program, they're like, yeah, we've got this tool, we've got that tool, we've got this tool, we've got that tool. You know, we do SAS, we do DAS, we do SCA, we do IAS. We do... Like, they're like, yeah, we've got a whole bunch of tools. Um, and I think that tools are very tempting because... Everyone's like, oh, we'll just automate this. It'll go in the CI/CD. You know, all the. You know, it's like almost like the. Uh, is it the old Honda commercials where sort of it's a uh, one thing rolling, knocks the next thing, knocks the next thing. Yeah, it's all going to be a very like nicely flowing process, and you know, everything's going to work nicely and automated, and we're going to be magically secure. Um, and the reality of what happens is that you have a load of automated tasks that run, and then give you a load of manual work to do. Like, well, what is this? What is that? What does that mean? Is this a real finding? Is it not a real finding? Um, and a lot of what I've been working on recently is saying, well. This is actually a problem. Like, this is actually a you know, real issue. And I think that when you're in the startup scale, it may be slightly easier, but I think there's still a very real you know, situation that automated tools bring you manual work as well. Maybe that whether that's putting them into place in the first place, sort of caring and feeding for them or getting the findings out afterwards. Um, so I'd certainly say, don't just put in a bunch of tools and expect that everything's going to be magically secure. Be ready for those processes as well. And actually that's one something I'm, actually working on building a training course for at the moment because I just see it as such a big sort of issue and a big sort of gap in the market at the moment about, okay, we've got these tools, how do we deal with them? Um, and that's a training course I'm going to be delivering at uh, the OWASP Global Conference, uh, which is running virtually in June. Um, 
because it's you know it's it's a real issue. I think people have just sort of run to tools as a way of trying to get secure easily, and then they discover that they have sort of converted one set of problems into another set of problems. Um, the other thing I would say is I think there's, there's a guy called Jim Manico who's very sort of prominent in the application security and spe specifically the training and education space. And he says that in his experience, all developers are security engineers nowadays. Um, I'm not sure that's quite the case um, in terms of whether they actually are, but I think they certainly need to be thinking in that way in the same way that performance, usability are part of development, security needs to be part of that as well. And I think you know, a developer, especially a developer at a startup, isn't going to learn everything about security up front, but sort of having that interest and having that awareness and using something like the proactive controls as a sort of a gateway into that as a basic overview of here are things I want to be thinking about in my day-to-day -day job as I'm as I'm building this software, I think is going to be a big, big benefit. You know, even when a, soft, a startup eventually recruits a security person, they still can't do everything. They still can't be everywhere at once. And having developers that are engaged and interested in security and sort of understand the key concepts and most of all aren't burnt out from dealing with tool problems i think is going to be a very sort of valuable you know short to midterm way of getting better security within the product yeah no, that's wonderful all right well i don't think it was that controversial um the first <laughs> your first point but uh it definitely uh we hope that our developers are thinking at least somewhat about security on some level um and Hopefully there, there's a feedback loop there back into, you know, the product overall. So, uh, Josh, thank you so much for your time. It was a really fun episode. Uh, got a you. lot, a lot of great information uh, and everyone should go definitely check out, uh, you know, OWASP's um, sites and uh, their events. So do you want to give us another uh, couple of points or a couple of uh, events and things happening in the near future? that people can or and where people can find the different projects um so yeah OWASP website is oasp.org um they run OWASP runs of global conferences in different regions different times of the year so the sort of the the eu focused uh, virtual conference is coming up in june i think there may well be a one for the apac region a little bit later later on in the year and i think they've already planned out one for the us in san francisco towards uh, november time so that's a good way and that's hopefully going to be in person as well. So you know, that's a really great way of sort of getting more information, but also check out your local OWASP chapter, find out where your local OWASP chapter is and you know, find out what they're doing, what uh, events they're putting on gradually. Sort of, we seem to be going back to in-person events and it's, uh, yeah, it's a great way to get engaged and, and find out more information. So I'd, I'd certainly advise people to look, at, look up on the OWASP.org. Um, and yeah, feel free to be in touch with me if anyone's got questions as well. Uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm on LinkedIn, um, put contact details and show notes or something. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Well, you can also tell us your Twitter handle. Yeah, my Twitter handle is Josh C. Grossman. So yeah, it's G-R-O-S-S-M-A-N. Easy enough, simple enough. Well, thanks again, Josh, so much for your time. We had a really great one and hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks so much. You too. Have a good one. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>